Distillation and reverse osmosis are great for removing a broad range of contaminants from water, but they also remove everything else, including the healthy minerals and electrolytes found naturally in water. That's why people often talk about remineralizing their purified water, adding things like pink Himalayan salt, lemon juice, or trace mineral drops to restore those missing elements. But what are you actually adding to your water when you do that? Does it really make your water healthier, or are you accidentally adding new contaminants? To find out, we tested six of the most common remineralization methods, all using distilled water as our baseline control. We dosed each sample precisely, shipped them to a certified lab for testing, and analyzed over a hundred data points to see what changed, and more importantly, what we might actually be drinking when we try to remineralize purified water at home. So in this video, I'm gonna show you which products added beneficial minerals like magnesium and potassium, and how others introduced things like aluminum, arsenic, lithium, and boron, all above conservative benchmarks that prioritize human health. To choose which remineralization methods to test, we looked at what real people are actually using. We spent time reading through online discussions, especially on forums like Reddit, where people share their routines for adding minerals back to distilled or RO water. Across hundreds of comments, the same suggestions came up again and again. Add salt, fresh lemon juice, or use liquid trace mineral products created specifically for this purpose. So we decided to prioritize the six most talked about and widely used methods. Pink Himalayan salt mixed as a saturated brine, often called sole water, Celtic sea salt prepared the same way, fresh lemon juice added directly to the water, Concentrase trace mineral drops, Aussie trace minerals, and Anderson's CMD trace mineral drops. These represent a wide range of natural and supplement-based approaches people seem to use most often to remineralize purified water, from simple pantry ingredients to purpose-made liquid minerals. And to ensure every change we measured came only from those products, we started with distilled water as our baseline to ensure the water had virtually no minerals or contaminants to begin with. Once we determined which Remin products to test, we built a controlled workflow to ensure that every sample was prepared the same way. We started with two brand new gallons of distilled water. Rather than combining them first, we poured 250 milliliters from each gallon into a dedicated 500 milliliter borosilicate beaker. We did this for every sample, including the baseline, so that each beaker contained 250 ml from jug A and 250 ml from jug B. This split pour approach ensured that all samples were drawn evenly from both jugs without introducing an extra mixing vessel. All dosing was done in metric for accuracy and to match the units in the TAP score reports. We used glass stir rods to avoid metal contamination and we kept air contact time short. The mixing and sampling sequence was the same each time. Fill the 500 ml beaker with distilled water, measure and add the remineralization dose, stir for 30 seconds with a dedicated glass rod, then immediately fill the tap score collection vials by pouring from the beaker directly into the vial. We capped each vial immediately and repeated the process for each product. All seven test kits, baseline plus six products, were then shipped to the lab the same day for analysis. Now, before actually conducting the test, we had to determine an appropriate dose of each remineralizing method to use. For the pink Himalayan salt and Celtic sea salt, we prepared sole, a saturated brine, by dissolving each salt in distilled water until undissolved crystals remained, which indicates full saturation. There are wildly different instructions online for how much sole to actually add, so we chose the one that makes the most sense for lab comparison. Large health websites like Healthline often recommend a daily intake of one teaspoon of sole per eight ounces of water. Scaling that to a 500 ml sample comes out to about 10.4 ml sole, which I figured would be extremely salty and not realistic for everyday remineralization. Some sources also advise starting at a quarter of that amount and working up. So for a more reasonable comparison with trace mineral drop products, we use that lower starter dose. A quarter teaspoon per eight ounces scaled to 500 ml, which equals about 2.6 ml of sole. 
We hoped that this dose would avoid overwhelming sodium and chloride while still representing what's most often recommended online. For fresh lemon juice, there's no single standard dose recommendation. Common guides suggest one half to one lemon per glass, which translates to a broad range in milliliters, depending of course on fruit size and juice yield. In our earlier planning, we benchmarked about 9.5 mLs per 16 ounces, and to keep things clean and metric, we scaled and rounded to 10 mLs of juice per 500 mL of water. This sits comfortably in the one half to one lemon per glass and aligns with the beaker volume we were testing. The Concentrase Trace Mineral Drops label guidance for remineralizing RO or distilled water is 20 to 40 drops per gallon. To avoid cherry picking the low end or the high end, we went with the midpoint, 30 drops per gallon, and converted that to metric to match our beaker size. This came out to about 3.96 drops per 500 ml, so we rounded to a practical four drops. The Aussie Trace Minerals serving guidance is 20 drops per 500 to 1000 ml. Because our test volume is 500 ml, we again went with the midpoint at 15 drops within the manufacturer's range and consistent with how many users say they dose in practice. Finally, the Anderson's CMD Trace Mineral Drops label says to mix 1 ml with at least 24 ounces of water. Converting that to our 500 ml beaker gives us about 0.7 ml, which equates to about 14 drops, assuming 20 drops equals 1 ml. This keeps us faithful to the manufacturer's proportions while fitting our 500 ml test volume. Now that you know how we executed this project, let's take a look at what the lab actually found. And if you like watching videos with data-driven testing, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. So starting with the distilled baseline, which came back exactly as expected. It had a pH of 6.3, slightly acidic, and a TDS below the method detection limit of four milligrams per liter. Every single mineral, metal, and inorganic compound was below detection limits. That means that this control sample was essentially a blank slate, no calcium, no magnesium, no potassium, no contaminants. So when we look at the other test results, we can say with certainty that everything detected came directly from the remineralization products we added. After adding pink Himalayan salt, the water's pH increased slightly to 6.6, .6, and its TDS skyrocketed to 1,000 800 milligrams per liter. We detected 594 milligrams per liter of sodium and 1,050 milligrams per liter of chloride, which is about 20 times higher than state and federal agencies recommended threshold for people on low sodium diets. The salt did add a small amount of magnesium, 2.68 milligrams per liter, calcium, 2.2 milligrams per liter, potassium, three milligrams per liter, and sulfate, 18.1 milligrams per liter, but these were minimal compared to the large sodium spike. We also saw 0 0.106 milligrams per liter aluminum, which exceeds the most conservative human health guideline level benchmark. Traces of manganese, chromium, barium, and strontium were also present, but below the HGL. So yes, pink Himalayan salt does add minerals, but it also adds metals and a massive amount of sodium. Celtic sea salt produced nearly identical results with pH coming in at 6.4 and an even higher TDS at 2,250 milligrams per liter, the highest of all samples we tested. It added 600 milligrams per liter of sodium and 1,030 milligrams per liter chloride, along with 38.9 of sulfate, 14.7 of magnesium, four of calcium, and 2.9 milligrams per liter of potassium. Slightly more minerals than Himalayan salt, but the same huge sodium spike. The bigger concern here are the unwanted contaminants detected. Celtic sea salt introduced 0 0.089 milligrams per liter aluminum and 0 0.0005 milligrams per liter arsenic, both exceeding health guidelines. Manganese, chromium, barium, and strontium were also detected in trace amounts, though below their respective HGLs. Lemon juice was by far the most acidic, 
with pH dropping all the way down to three, the lowest of all samples, and TDS increased to 377 milligrams per liter. Lemon juice added 25 milligrams per liter potassium, plus small amounts of magnesium, 1.49, sulfate and calcium, 1.1, chloride, 2, and phosphorus, 1.5 milligrams per liter. It also introduced a handful of other trace substances, including zinc, copper, fluoride, barium, strontium, manganese, chromium, and vanadium. Importantly, lemon juice was the only method that did not introduce unwanted, potentially harmful contaminants above health guideline level benchmarks. The trade-off, of course, is acidity. At pH 3, this water could contribute to tooth enamel erosion if consumed regularly, and it doesn't really provide strong remineralization. Next up, with concentrase trace mineral drops, the pH rose slightly to 6.4, and TDS increased to 180 milligrams per liter. We detected 28.5 milligrams per liter magnesium, 87 chloride, and 6.2 milligrams per liter sulfate, which shows the drops are affected at restoring some electrolytes. However, the lab also found 0 0.303 milligrams per liter lithium and 0 0.0011 milligrams per liter arsenic, both exceeding health guideline levels. Boron was also detected at 0.232 milligrams per liter, but still below the HGL. These trace contaminants likely come from the product source, Utah's Great Salt Lake, which is known to have lithium, boron, and arsenic. When the lake water is evaporated to concentrate minerals, everything in it becomes concentrated, unfortunately also including these unwanted impurities. Aussie Trace Minerals gave us a pH of 7.8, slightly more alkaline, and TDS of 695 milligrams per liter. It delivered 113 milligrams per liter magnesium, nearly four times that of concentrates, along with 10.8 milligrams per liter potassium, 185 chloride, 45.4 of sulfate, and just 7.9 milligrams per liter of sodium. However, it also introduced 0 0.0007 milligrams per liter arsenic and 0 0.521 milligrams per liter boron, both above their respective HGLs. Trace amounts of selenium and fluoride were also detected below their HGLs. These drops are sourced from solar concentrated ocean water off of Australia's coast, and natural seawater often contains trace arsenic and boron. Anderson's CMD trace minerals had the biggest impact on pH, rising to 8.4, the highest of all samples, and its TDS measured at 793 milligrams per liter. It provided 100 36 milligrams per liter magnesium, more than any other product we tested. It also had 24.3 milligrams per liter sulfate, 447 milligrams per liter chloride, and 1.83 milligrams per liter sodium. But that came with significant contamination. 1.39 milligrams per liter lithium, 0.96 milligrams per liter boron, and 0 0.0049 milligrams per liter arsenic, all above health guidelines. It also added trace molybdenum and selenium, both within safe limits. These results are very close to concentrases, since both products actually come from the same source. But Anderson's CMD introduced even higher levels of lithium and boron, likely due to the higher recommended dosage. So when we compare all six methods side by side, clear patterns emerge. Both pink Himalayan and Celtic sea salt raised sodium and chloride concentrations to impractical levels, creating water that was chemically closer to seawater than spring water. Both also introduced trace metals, including aluminum and arsenic, confirming that natural salts often contain naturally occurring impurities that remain after evaporation. Lemon juice was the opposite extreme. It added modest amounts of beneficial nutrients, especially potassium, but made the water highly acidic. While it was the only method that didn't introduce contaminants above health guideline levels, its low pH makes it unsuitable as a primary remineralization approach for daily drinking. 
The trace mineral drops were the most effective at adding magnesium and increasing pH, but all three introduced unwanted contaminants, most notably arsenic, lithium, and boron, above conservative human health guideline levels. Interestingly, the differences among the three drops largely reflect their dosing intensity. Concentrase was dosed at only 4 drops per 500 ml, following the product label, while Aussie Trace Minerals and Anderson's CMD were dosed at 15 and 14 drops respectively, roughly 4 times higher. Because these products all originate from concentrated mineral brines, their contaminant concentrations scale almost linearly with dose. That means if we'd added 14 or 15 drops of concentrates instead of 4, its results would likely have shown comparable levels of minerals and other contaminants to the other two. Across the board, none of the six methods produced a balanced mineral profile. Each offered clear trade-offs, either excessive sodium, unsafe acidity, or unwanted contaminants, showing that DIY approaches can't fully replicate the chemistry of natural mineral water. So if you're trying to remineralize purified water, remember to weigh the benefits of added minerals against the risk of introducing new impurities. If you'd rather have water that's both mineralized and safe, without the extra legwork of measuring and mixing, look for a certified reverse osmosis system with built-in remineralization. Systems like AquaTrue and CloudRO have remineralization filters that add calcium, magnesium, and potassium back into the water without introducing contaminants like arsenic, lithium, or boron something my own independent lab testing has also confirmed. If you'd like to see those results and how these systems performed in our testing, click or tap to keep watching. And if you found this kind of data-driven testing helpful, give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. We've got dozens more projects just like this, all backed by hands-on product testing and lab data.